welcome everybody. This is our uh, annual bee event. Everything you always wanted to know about bees, but we're also going to uh, overlap with aquaponics and aeroponics, organic gardening, because sustainability overlaps with everything. Everything in the universe, everything on the planet is connected. And so one of the things uh, that we're going to be talking about today is how bees actually are, uh, there's a, I was at a meeting last week, and it had a honeybee, and it said on the top, if we die, we're taking you with us. <laughs> okay, so so in LA, the city of LA, uh, up to this point, uh, you could be a hobbyist, but in terms of like having an actual beehive, the city of LA was very like, no, 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 no. Well, because of what's happening to bee population, you know, uh, the demand, uh, the demand was so great it, it got approved. And so uh, there's a lot of misapprehensions, a lot of questions. People have fears about bees. What if my neighbor has them? Am I going to get stung? So all those are a lot of good questions. Um, up to this point, beekeeping, like I said, has been a hobby. But in the East Coast, it's actually beekeeping is a huge, huge thing. And uh, so as soon as it got legalized, uh, there's a company called the Best Bee Company uh, from East Coast uh, that is moving into the LA area. And so they're, for finally, Los Angeles has a professional beekeeping company. It's the first that I know of. Um, and so uh, one of the representatives is going to be giving our presentation today. She's a professional beekeeper, been at this for a long, long time. Uh, we'll have questions and answers everywhere. Anyway, I want to welcome our first speaker, uh, Kelly Allen. Thank you for coming today. It's great to see everyone here interested in bees and learning more about them. Uh, we'll go over a little bit about the Best Bees Company and what we're doing. We'll talk about what's happening to bees, why they're so important, and then we'll get into what we can actually all do on an individual level to help them. So, the Best Bees Company is a full beekeeping service company. So what we do is we install and manage honey beehives for anybody who wants them, and we use that honey to fund our research to try to make bees healthier. So the company was started by Dr. Noah Wilson Rich back in 2010. So he had just gotten his degree from Tufts University. He knew he wanted to continue studying bees, um, but he's having trouble getting grant funding to do his research. So he got resourceful, got online, made a Facebook page offering our services, installation and management of beehives. Um, and then in the first year, he sold seven hives, you know, raised a little bit of money for his research. And now here we are, six years later, we have over 400 hives set up across nine different cities in the U.S. So Best Bees has absolutely taken off over the past few years, and we're still a research-focused company. So over the past couple years, we actually broke out a second entity of Best Bees, and that's called the Urban Beekeeping Lab and Bee Sanctuary. So this is actually a nonprofit organization that is focused more on the research side of things, while Best Bees is more of the business side, raising some money for our research and taking care of our clients. Um, so the way it works is we install a hive on your property, so it can either be like in a yard like this, or on a rooftop of a hotel, or a corporate center, or a restaurant, and we check in on the bees, you know, as often as we need to. It's generally every month, certain times of the year, it's more frequently. So we do all the work while you get the benefits of the bees. So we harvest all the honey for you, you get to have the pollination services for your garden, you know, you get to enjoy seeing them flying around. Um, and we actually update all of our clients after each hive visit because we have a custom app that was created by one of our co-founders. So in this app, we record all of the hive data. So it will we'll record how many bees we saw, how much honey was in the hive, the overall health, if there were any diseases. So we can really keep track of all of these hives because it's a lot to manage having over 400 hives. We want to make sure that each hive has what it needs. Um, and then, on the other hand, we can use all of this data for our research. So, all of this data that we collect actually lets us evaluate the health of honeybees all across the country, which is really cool. Um, helps our clients, helps us with our research, in turn helps the bees as well. So, it seems like scientists 
all over the world are in a race right now to determine what's killing the bees. You know, nobody's working together, and it's kind of sad. They're all working against each other because they want to be the one to know what's hurting the bees. Well, our research kind of takes a different approach. It's a little bit more on the positive side. We're trying to research ways to make bees healthier and make them less susceptible to the diseases that they're facing. So it's actually really cool and really easy what we're doing. One of our main projects is... It's basically like making bee yogurt. So it's like probiotics for bees. And all you need to do is mix a little bit of sugar and a little bit of water together to make like a, a fondant sort of substance. And then you add in your active ingredients. So we're not using any chemicals here. We're just using natural ingredients like probiotics. And you kind of pop it in the hive. The bees love it. They eat it right up. And then we test the bees for various diseases and see if our active ingredients are helping them or not. Um, so. The work that Best Views is doing and the Urban Beekeeping Lab Laboratory helped to, to fund this research. Well, it's a known fact that our bees are dying, uh, but it's actually really important to understand why we need our bees. So, I know it seems like their honey might be the most important thing to everyone, but it's actually their pollination services that we need the most. So bees are attracted to the sweet smelling nectar of flowers. They, they forage for nectar and pollen from flowers. And when they're visiting flowers, they harvest pollen from the anthers or the male parts of the flower. And then as they buzz along to the next flower, some of that pollen will drop off of their bodies into the stigma or the female part of the flower. And at that point, pollination is able to occur. So about 75% of flowering plants rely on pollinators, and our honeybees pollinate over 130 different crops. This is, brings in an estimated $15 billion annually, and honeybees account for one in every three bites of food that we take. So if we were to lose all of our honeybees, you know, we would survive, we would be okay, but our plates and our diets would be a lot less bland. We wouldn't have all of those flavors and colors that we love so much. And I know there's some people out there who might say, well, I don't even like my green vegetables anyway, so who cares? <laughs> well, there's bad news for those people too. Honeybees actually pollinate alfalfa plants, which farmers use to feed their cattle. So without our bees, we see serious changes even further down the line in the meat and dairy industries as well. There are a lot of reasons why bees are dying, which is what makes solving the problem so complicated. They're facing threats because of habitat destruction, unsustainable farming practices, climate change, and a lot of different diseases. So all across the country, especially in the Midwest, we're seeing all of these monocrop farms pop up, especially planting corn. So this is the, probably the biggest bee habitat is our prairie lands in the Midwest. And all of these wildflowers are just being clear cut in order to build these monocrop farms. And in addition to these monocrop farms, they're usually piling on pesticides, which has an even worse effect on the bee populations. In addition, we're experiencing hotter and drier summers and even colder winters. So these extreme weather conditions are really hard on the bees as well. Perhaps the most talked about honeybee disease is colony collapse disorder. That seems to be the one that people hear about the most or have the most questions about. So, this phenomenon was first noticed back around 2006, and it's characterized by a rapid loss of adult worker bees in the hive. So it's really hard to study colony class because the bees aren't just dying, they're completely disappearing. There aren't even dead bodies around the hive to study to look into the causes. So it's very, very strange, and beekeepers are seeing 30% losses in their colonies every year because of colony collapse. Another one of the major diseases hurting bees is the varroa mite. So this spread across the world in the 1900s and made it to the U.S. by 1987. So these are parasitic little mites that kind of latch onto the bees and weaken them. So to give you a size comparison, it'd be the equivalent of a rabbit-sized parasite on a human. So imagine carrying that around on your back. Not a fun time. And the reason that the varroa mites are so destructive is because they disrupt the life cycle of bees. So normally the queen bee will lay an egg inside one of the hexagonal cells in the hive, and two or three days later that egg actually hatches into a larva, and then the worker bees will feed that larva with honey and pollen. Four or five days later they'll actually cap that cell off with wax as the larva develops into a pupa. 
And then two or three weeks later, the pupa will emerge and be an adult worker bee. So for the remainder of their four to six week life, they'll carry out duties in the hive, um, they'll forage for, for food, they'll feed other larval bees. Well, when the varroa mites involved, they actually feed on bees that are in that larval stage. So when they later emerge as adult worker bees, they're weakened. They don't survive as long. One of the major challenges that beekeepers face is getting their bees to survive through the winter. And this is because the queen stops laying eggs in the colder month and the worker bees stop foraging for food. So basically they all stay inside of the hive, huddle together for warmth and eat their honey. Well, when there's a varroa infestation in the hive, these worker bees can't survive the winter because normally they're only alive for four to six weeks, but in the winter months they have to survive for three or four months or so. So if the varroa mites are involved, they're not able to survive for this extended period of time and the queen's not laying eggs to regenerate the population, so a lot of beekeepers are seeing their hives dead at the end of the winter with varroa mites in the bottom board of the hive, indicating that there is a varroa infestation. Question, is there any way to get rid of these mites? You can treat them um, with chemicals. We don't do that at besties. It's, it's controversial amongst beekeepers whether or not they want to treat for them. Um, but you can leave like sticky strips in the hive or them to you. But kind of our theory at besties is we don't want to treat because we want to be only keeping the bee populations that can fight off the varroa mites and survive and withstand the infection. Um, and then sort of, I, I know it's sad and kind of a bummer, but you know, let the ones go that can't withstand it. So we're building a stronger overall population okay. of bees. Yeah. Um, the Nosema virus is another infection that's hurting bees. So this actually attacks the digestive system of bees. And the, the probiotic research that we're doing at Best Bees is actually targeting the Nosema virus. So I know it seems grim, you know, our bees are so important to our economy, to our ecosystems. There's so many threats that they're facing, like what could we possibly do to help them? The good news is there's a ton that we can each do on an individual level to help our bees. And I think the biggest thing that we can do is to vote with our forks. So Michael Pollan said that we change the natural world by our eating choices more than anything else that we do. It's believed that right now, only about 5% of the food that we eat in this country is organic food. And I know that we can do better than that. We can definitely do so much better than that. All of us, we live in Los Angeles. There are so many local farmers markets to choose from happening every day here. We have no excuse to be eating sustainable, organic, local food. It's good for us. It's good for the local economy. It's good for the bees. Everybody wins. It's something we can all do very easily. Another thing is plant flowers. We can plant them everywhere, you know? You have a front yard, a backyard, a rooftop, a balcony. Plant flowers. People go crazy. There are gorilla farmers who will be like seed bombing traffic medians in the highway. You can plant flowers anywhere. <laughs> Something that everyone can do whether you have a green thumb or not. And if you're not going to do it for the bees, at least do it for the honey. It takes two million flowers to produce one jar of honey. So the bees need more flowers. Wow. If you are into gardening, you know, look at the types of flowers that will attract bees in your area. So in Southern California, that would be things like lavender, sage, and California poppy. And the key here is to plant flowers that are going to bloom in succession throughout the course of the year to have a constant pollen and nectar flow for the bees. So if you plant these types of plants, you'll see bees in your garden year-round. Um, you'll know that they're foraging for food right in your own backyard. You can do a simple Google search and you'll get tons of results. I think there's a whole page on honeylove.com that will tell you what flowers are the best uh, to plant for bees. If you are a gardener, use sustainable gardening practices. Use native and drought tolerant plants. And avoid the use of pesticides and chemical fertilizers. Those really hurt bees, they hurt other pollinators, and you don't want that in your food anyway. Um, consider building a compost. It's so easy to do. It's so fun. I do worm composting right inside of my kitchen. It's not gross. It doesn't smell. It's actually kind of relaxing to like dig through it and see what's going on in there. Definitely consider it. It's fun and the fertilizer that you get out of it is absolutely amazing. Another thing that everyone can do, and this is probably the easiest and definitely one of the most important, is to provide a water source for bees. So it's no secret we're experiencing one of the worst droughts ever right now in Southern California. Well, our wildlife is experiencing that drought too. 
bees can actually go through up to a gallon of water a day on a really hot day. So they need water. And Mike's yard is a great example. There's water sources all over the place. I was here a few weeks ago, and there are actually bees flying around in here getting water. And the key to, to having a water source for them is to have some sort of like stepping stone that they can stand on so they don't fly into the water and drown. So if you float some corks in a bucket of water or just kind of fill like a container with stones or like a bird bath with stones so they have something to rest on while they stop for a drink, then you're helping the bees out immensely by doing that. And lastly, just love your bees. Be mindful in the choices that you're making. Make sure you're supporting sustainable food systems. And if you're up for it, become a beekeeper. There's tons of local resources to get you started. Best Bees can help get you started if you want to do it yourself. If you're a little intimidated by it or not really sure where to start, consider getting a managed hive through us. We would love to do that for you. Especially in cities, bees, are, bees do a lot better in cities. So urban beekeeping is, is on the rise. Um, it's really good for bees. With best bees, we're finding that about three-fourths of colonies survive the winter in cities, compared to only like two out of five out in the country with our rural clients. And they're producing one-third more honey in cities than in other areas. So we're not really sure why bees are doing better. It could be because it's warmer in cities. There's fewer pesticides being used. Maybe people are planting a wider diversity of flowers. Maybe there's more flowers available year-round. Whatever it is, the bees are doing better here. So we should support urban bee populations. Um, and in addition, urban food systems. There's a lot of urban agriculture going on in LA, and we need bees to pollinate these crops. You can build a sustainable garden, too. I mean, Mike and his amazing network can help you out with that. I mean, just look at this yard. This is all sustainable. This is all drought-tolerant, drought-resistant. If you are a gardener, definitely consider more sustainable practices. There's always more that we can do. And lastly, change your perspective on bees and help to change the perspective of others. It's usually interpreted that bees are aggressive and angry and are going to sting you. They actually die when they sting you. They sting you as a, very, as a last resort. Honeybees are generally docile in nature. It's estimated that there are 11 wild hives per square mile in LA. With 60,000 bees per hive, that's 726,000 bees per square mile. So they're all around us, whether we know it or not. We're not out here getting stung every day. You can see the bees even flying around here right now. So they're all around us. You know, We need them, they need us, so let's do what we can to help them. Thank you, guys. Yeah. A honey bee and a mason bee. And a mason bee? Mm -hmm. So I'm not super familiar with mason bees, but I, I believe they're solitary bees, so they like to drill holes. And they actually live alone, so they wouldn't live in like a big hive okay. like this. Okay. Um, they live alone and generally drill holes like in the ground or in like wood or like trees or something like that. Whereas honeybees are social, so they live in a colony in a hive. They have one queen and then thousands of worker bees. Mm. But they, they do the same thing. They both pollinate. Yeah, yeah. So they would target different flowers probably. So there's <laughs> over 20,000 different bee species. Um, they all fulfill their own ecological niches. So they're pollinating different flowers, foraging for food from different sources. So in the city here, do you have to get a license or a certified? In the city here, do you have to get a license to be certified to be a beekeeper? Right no, you don't have to have a license. So beekeeping was just legalized here back in October. Um, you don't need a license for it. They do ask that you register your hives with LA County, just so they can tell you if they're going to be like spraying for pesticides or oh. anything like that. But I think it costs ten dollars to register your hive. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you do a hive, you do everything. We do everything. We so we bring it all. What was that? <laughs> we don't have to touch it. You don't it at have all. to put on a suit. You don't have to get in there at all. If we can harvest no, the honey no, for you. No. If you wanted to do that yourself, you no. could remove it from the hive. But yeah, no, we do absolutely everything. No, um, we have dogs. Would that be a problem with the dogs? No, the dogs dogs generally know to stay away. I mean okay. if they get stung once they'll they'll know like to stay away from there. But the, the bees are, are really docile, I mean. Okay. Some of our clients have them in Boston on, on balconies, and they use the hive as like a cocktail table. So the bees are right there, they're right out next to them. Yeah, it's kind of cool. As long as you're not like opening up the hive and like going through everything and like pulling it apart, they don't feel threatened and they won't, they won't sting you. So if you had a managed hive, it would 
be just one of those in your backyard, or would there be more than one? Yeah, so this is kind of a standard, basic, like, starter hive. So this is all this is all the space that you would need. We usually prop them up on cinder blocks just to keep, like, ants and other pests out. Um, and then as the hive grows, we'll add more of these boxes on top. So it'll be up to three of these boxes tall, but it doesn't require any more space than this. You can tuck it, like, in the corner of your yard, up on a rooftop, or on a porch, or anything like that. Why don't you show us the frames? Yeah. So in here, these are all unbuilt frames, but we use natural wood and 100% natural beeswax. We don't use any plastic in our hives. And this kind of just gives the bees a foundation to work off of. So they store all of their honey and lay all their eggs in hexagonal shaped cells. And these frames actually have the, the hexag hexagons like built into them if you guys want to like pass it around and take a look at it. It's all natural beeswax. It smells really good to you. So do you put a certain amount of bees in there, like a couple workers at yeah. a queen, or? Yeah, so we start with, the, the way it works is you generally order what's called a package of bees. So it's like a little three pound box and it will be like a starter colony with a queen. Um, so you would put them into here. Uh, you can give them some sugar water feed in a, in a feeder like this. There's like little netting ladders that go down where they can kind of rest on and drink up the sugar water. Um, so they would start in just a box this size, just one box, and then as the colony grows, you add boxes on top. What's the disadvantage? There's real, yeah, I mean, there's really no disadvantage to it unless you want it to be a beekeeper yourself. But if you don't want to, if you want to have all the benefits of bees, you know, have the honey and not have to get in there and actually be surrounded by thousands of bees, then we're happy to do all the work for you. <laughs> and, and you do tracking of all these different hives in the different places. So not only are you benefiting your garden, but we're benefiting research. Right, right. You're benefiting our research efforts to, to try to make bees stronger and just to evaluate the status of bee health all across the country. What do you charge? Well, how did you make your money? So the pricing depends on location, but it starts at twelve ninety five for the entire year. Um, and that covers all of the hive equipment, the bees, routine check-ins, you know, updates, your honey harvesting. Um, if something should happen to your bees and they don't make it through the winter or they, they die for some reason or your queen dies, you replace your bees at no additional cost. So. How long does the queen live? The queen can generally live for one to three years. It's best in this area to reclean them every year, so we, we do monitor that closely. Can you take that queen and kill it? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds harsh, but it's better for the colony in the long run, usually. Yeah. It's healthier. You keep the honey. What do they do? They, they kill, kill the, the, the every weak year. queen. What? No. They trade her in for a younger model. This is LA. This is LA. Makes sense. No, then you don't get a strong girl. I don't believe it. I don't like it. I don't either. What's required if you're interested in doing this? Like, if we're interested in doing a deck and we need just an outdoor space. All you need is a space this size, really. I mean, we have bees on high rises downtown that are their own. Yeah, they stories, make themselves. and they do just fine. So they really adapt to the environment that they're in. They travel up to five miles to forage for food. So they're smart. They know how to find their food. Um, as long as they have a home base to come back to, then they're good. It's better to keep them like out of direct sunlight. Um, you can kind of face the hive entrance, like through a wall or, or something, to kind of like get them like up and out of your yard. If you don't want them like buzzing around constantly, but they really don't need a lot as long as they have like a water source. As long as they're being checked on routinely. Give them water. Like, direct direct sunlight's not bad for them, but if you can keep them out, it's better. How much honey do you want to make? So a hive. A frame this size can actually hold 10 pounds of honey. Uh, in the first year, we generally don't get to harvest honey from them just because the bees are still building up their resources and food stores. So we try, we tend not to harvest in the first year, but one hive can produce 25 to 100 pounds of honey in a single year. So you could have more honey than you know what to do with. Do you oh, wait, we have to keep the honey or can you take it too? <laughs> <laughs> you can sell it. I mean, people go crazy for organic local honey. You can sell like a 16 ounce jar of honey for like $30. It's kind of ridiculous. So if you bring it to like a farmer's market or makes great gifts for your friends, it's good for your neighbors, especially if they're not like super keen on you having bees in your yard. It can kind of help to warm them up a little bit. Do you use small cells on the frames, on the wax frames? Do we use what? Small cell? Yeah, so I know you can get the frames that have the, the bigger drone cells to help with white populations, 
Uh, but we only use the, the smaller cell frames. So that's another good point. If you have drones, they will attract the varroa mite. Yeah, yeah. And that will protect the, the female workers. Right. Right. It's, it's actually a good natural way to get rid of varroa mites in your hive. Is, uh, so when the queen bee lays eggs, she is only laying eggs for female bees. So all of the bees in the hive are female. And the drones, they're good for nothing. They eat up all the food. They fly out trying to mate with queens. They don't do anything. So when food sources are scarce, they actually kill the drones or kick them out of the hive. Yeah. I have a comment on that. <laughs> drones are good for something. They keep the hive cooler in the summer. Mm -hmm. They protect from the varroa mites. Yeah. They also make for a happier hive, and they don't not do nothing because they breed with the queen. <laughs> they do. They, we, yeah, we need some drones, but we need what? some, but not, not a lot. No, she just kills the queen. What? She's just killing the queen. They're giving yeah, them the new right. queen. But, but drones are good. They're, yeah, they're not good for But she's nothing. not killing the drones. No, I know. <laughs> but I'm saying the, cell, the, the cells that they're using uh -huh. on those frames are too small for the drones. Oh. Well, can't you alternate? They, maybe they, the queen one, can, they one can still lay drone, drone eggs in, on, on these sizes. Um, there's just not, it doesn't encourage them to lay more drone eggs when you use this size. But they do have a couple drones in there. Yeah, yeah. Certain, at this time of year, some of our hives we're seeing, we're seeing a small drone population in the hive. The frames that are used for drones, they're used so that people can actively kill them. Right. That's where the mites are being bred is on the, is on the drone. Oh. So when people use drone frames, it's because that encourages the queen to lay the drones there, and therefore they can control where they want to kill the drones. So I think there's an additional fee, it's like $200 to move the hive, but we can definitely can take care of that for you. We usually like wrap them all up, or we'll, if it's small enough, we'll transfer the bees into like a new box and move them, but we've done that before. Okay. We've had clients where um, they couldn't keep them on their site anymore, it was actually a hotel, so we moved them all to our personal apiary. Um, we kept the bees for them there, and still sent them updates and checked in frequently. <coughs> and so they were still their bees, but they were just at our property instead. Now we had a bad beehive with this keep the other bees from making another hive right by this one? Not necessarily. I mean, we, we have um, locations that have like 12 hives all lined up together, so they can all coexist in a small area. Um, by having a honeybee hive, you're not like kicking out native bees or like wild bees or anything like that. They all, they all coexist together. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you guys. If you have, if you guys want to become beekeepers or have any questions about best bees and what we do, or if you want to be directed to some local sources for bees, uh, I can help you out with that. David works with me with the Best Bees Company. He'd be happy to help you out too. Bee season is actually just getting started at the end of April, so if you do want to become a beekeeper, it's not too late. You can still get your equipment and order your bees and get set up for this year. So definitely keep that in mind if it's something that you're interested. What's in. your well, website? If you do the rent of one. You, we don't have to set up the bees, right? No, we do all that for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Web, okay. website. <laughs> website. Yeah, and our website it's uh, bestbees.com. Um, if you want to check it out, we're on Facebook and Instagram as well too.